they're super scientific, 25th century. This program is brought to you by the Popsicle, Butterscle, and Greensicle. Those delicious uh, frozen confections on a stick. And now, for the thrilling adventures of Buck Rogers in the 25th century. We return to where we left off, the future capital of the United States located in Niagara, where Buck, Wilma, and Buddy have come to the aid of America's brilliant scientist, Dr. Fjord, only to have been outwitted by their villainous foe, the treacherous Moscow Morris. Shall we join them there? Yes? Okay, here we go. 500 years into the future. I'm a doctor here. Um, <laughs> look, quick, he's getting away. Say, Dr. Gear, what's with all the special effects? One second, Moscow Morris is here in front of me, but then, in a flash, he's gone in a very instant. Oh, I'm afraid those were no special effects, Buck, but rather the workings of my new scientific device, the <laughs> hypno-electronic chronoventilosphere. <laughs> oh, Dr. Hewer, you're always inventing a hypno-electromentilo something or other. What is it that this one does? Is it anything like your hypno-electric mental fellow or mentaloscope? No, <laughs> well, sort of. The hypno-electronic chronometelosphere allows someone to experience the past. I did, however, build in a safeguard so that one cannot directly interact with it and can only view it. Treated as if you were a ghost walking around a sort of moving painting. I fear that mischievous devil, Moscow Morris, was unaware of that aspect, however. Don't worry, Dr. Fuhrer. Oh, wait. Sorry, two-sided, right? <laughs> that was me. But <laughs> Gee whiz, Dr. Hewer, that sure is a fascinating device you've assembled, but what would Moscow Morris want with it anyway? Hmm, that's a tough one. I think I may have figured it out. 500 years ago, you well know, the great American nation secured a victory for democracy by putting an end to communism as we know it. Or so we thought. It turns out that some, finding the earth no longer suitable for the unwholesome ways, have flung themselves out amongst the neighboring planets, and have been hiding there ever since. Moscow Morris, it seems had established itself on the planet Mars and has been hiding there for some time. Of course. Leave it to the communists to hide out on the red planet. <laughs> well, looking at the dials, Morris has sent himself back to the 19th century, a hundred years before your time, Buck. And looking at the lever here, it says he specified a place in California called Fort Ross. Wait a minute. In California? Every school kid knows that California no longer exists after crashing into the ocean. <laughs> oh, no, buddy. California still existed back then. That wouldn't happen until the great earthquake that ravaged the West Coast during the early 21st century. It seems that Port Ross was a staging point for an enterprise called the Russian American Company, who were there primarily for hunting the sea otters and establishing an agricultural system uh, to support their other ventures in the northern, the northern Pacific. My guess is that Moscow Morris, using its new machine, or money machine, uh, has tried to go back in time to establish a stronger Russian presence in the United States and thereby alter the course of history and delivering a devastating blow to our beloved way of life. Well, that clever devil. But you said you built in some sort of safety measure, right? Can he do any harm to the past? Uh, no, he can't. Um, but he can't stay, in stay there indefinitely either. His very absence from the extended period will rip apart the very fabric of time we know. Don't worry, Dr. Pure. We'll bring that red menace back for you, and don't you worry yourself one bit. Wilma, why don't you come with me back into the past? Buddy, you stay here and help Dr. Hero. Aw, oh, Chucks, you never let me go on your adventures, but Dr. Hero needs all the help he can get. Don't you worry, buddy. You'll be going on your own adventures soon enough. <laughs> right. Now, if you, Buck, and you, Wilma, will stand over there. I just need to recharge the activator, uh, set this dial here back to its original position, and let's see, oh yes. Pull this lever. All right, and we're all set to send you back to the early uh, 19th century. Sound effects, sound effects, sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we made it safe and sound, all in one piece. Yes, and look at this landscape. Have you ever seen trees this big before in your entire life? I sure have. They're called redwoods, and are local to some of California's coastal regions. Look over there. You can see the Russian stockade. It seems as if they've made those towering walls out of hundreds of them. Oh, let's go check it out. That would be the first place Moscow Morris is likely to go. Meanwhile, back in the 25th century. Say, Dr. Heard, you say that the Russians were hunting sea otters. Were they doing it for their meat? Oh, no, buddy. They were hunting them for their pelts. Back then, there was a large demand for them in China, where they could fetch a fair price. But, mind you, it was uh, not the Russians that were hunting them. The company was made up of a good number of different people. From the north, they brought with them many men from, uh, native to Alaska, where they, um, who were skilled uh, 
in the hunting of sea mammals. He also employed a great many native Californians uh, from such tribes as the Kishai of Como and Bodega Miwa to help them in their seasonal labor. Well, isn't that something? And they all got along with each other? In my space travels, it doesn't seem to matter if you are a Saturnian prince or a Plutonian pauper. No one seems to stay friendly for long anywhere. I'm afraid you're right, buddy. When the Russian American company first arrived, a number of the women uh, from the local California tribe married into the um, married some of the native Alaskan men, thereby establishing bonds between their people and the company. Well, there wasn't uh, nearly as much violence being enacted like that in the place in the south um, by the Spanish missionaries. Tensions could be felt along racial and class-based lines. Geez, that sure is too bad. Say, I wonder what Wilma and Buck are up to. Look here, Wilma. It seems that even though the Russians erected this large stockade and garrisoned it with troops armed with guns and cannons, most of the activity of day-to-day -day life is taking place outside of its walls. It is strange. I vaguely remember learning about Fort Ross back in the 20th century, where I'm originally from, but I don't remember hearing anything about the Alaskan village being set up outside the stockade's perimeter. That's not altogether surprising. It seems that it wasn't until the end of your own 20th century book that people started to take a closer look at those left, often left out of the popular histories and documentary records. Archaeologists have helped a great deal to give voice to the voiceless and shine a light upon the many forgotten recesses of the past. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, over here, Wilma. I thought I saw something in one of those thatched houses. Could be that rascal, Roscoe Morris. Let's check it out, Buck. I'll take the right, you take the left. Hmm, looks like a false alarm. It's only a woman doing her household chores. <laughs> <laughs> what do we have here? She seems to be from one of the native Californian tribes. I wonder what she is doing in the Alaskan village. I don't know, but she certainly looks sad. It looks as if she's simply staring out at something cradled in the palm of her hand. I think it may be a small glass bead of some sort. Look at how the brilliance of its blue shines in the light. She's probably sad that she broke one of her favorite fashionable necklaces, I bet. Oh, I don't know about that, Buck. You have to remember that people from any walk of life can be quite different from our own. We cannot project our own cultural understandings onto another and expect them to think and act the same ways we do. It says here on my daily, watch here on my wrist, that the native Californians use beads for a number of purposes, and what you call fashion was only one of the men. How about that? What else did they use them for? <laughs> Says here that beads were often traded. Before Westerners came to the Pacific coast, the native Californians crafted beads from various seashells. As such, certain beads of color and craftsmanship could bring with them a good deal of respect and prestige. Furthermore, such beads were exhibited in a great many ways as well. Look at those baskets in the corner just there. Some of them were so expertly woven that they could hold water. But if you look closely, some of the beads have incorporated into their very designs. I suppose you're right, Mama. What can't we learn about people in the past, I wonder? I agree with you on that, Buck, but let's get going. What do you say we go find Morris and teach him a thing or two? Will Buck and Wilma capture the villainous foe? Will the fate of the world rest prepares on the brink of impending disaster? Find, uh, find out in the next thrilling installment of Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Yeah. <laughs> Just a reminder, please help yourself to food and refreshments at the back of those if you your time. Um, so we're next going to turn uh, to Annie Janis, uh, who is getting her PhD in archaeology at Berkeley. Uh, she's interested in the intersection of art and archaeology and using the sensory as a method, um, as well as looking at uh, the connections among objects, people, landscapes, and history. So Annie Janis. Uh, I am collaborating here with Annie Malcolm um, and Zach Kelly, and so we have the next 20 minutes of your time, which is great, and you'll have to move a few times during this piece, but the first is actually to um, try and kind of cluster more in this area, because um, Annie Malcolm is going to be doing some movement here, um, so you guys might need to move over maybe into the middle. And just um, introduce so, Annie Malcolm, who's also yes. an anthropology at, so, at Berkeley. Yes. 
Um, so, <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. And, and she's interested in time-based and performance art, uh, especially in China, uh, and looking at Chinese language and philosophy as well as urban forms. And she undertook a lot of performances in New York before coming here. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Brian. Sorry. Malcolm and Dennis. Um, so we're presenting a piece called Not Seen Seen, uh, which is a collaborative performance consisting of movement um, by Annie Malcolm and sound by Annie Dennis, um, production by Zach Kelly. Um, and what we're presenting here today is a sketch of an exploration of memory, experience, and expertise in archaeological knowledge production through its sonic and sensorial dimensions. Uh, the sound portion of the piece is constructed out of clips from field recordings that um, I archived from 2008 to the present that spans archaeological work um, across North America, um, specifically New Mexico, Colorado, Georgia, and California. Um, and Annie Malcolm's movement indexes our collective analysis of the experience represented by the clips and the contingency of their relationship to archaeological data. So um, we'll present the piece, and then afterwards we're going to um, do some exercises that sort of explain our process and our uh, vision for what performance has to do with archaeology.
can get out there and get everything. You can set the whole thing all in the back of the house. You have a nice big pool beach or a water or any other thing. So I, I see better times up here. So it's a mix. Let's see. We'll see. We have all this in this area. We took several hundred years of topsoil to build up. Tool that uh, 
as archaeologists, we can explore. Um, so to explain a little bit, to start off, how we did make this piece, um, I curated the clips out of a huge library of clips that I have um, from the last handful of years. Um, and Annie Malcolm listened to them without any prefiguring of what they might actually be. She named them and created gestures and phrases associated uh, with what she considered to be the primary uh, content or mood of the clip. Um, uh, Zach Kelly and I independently built a composition that explored the texture of these sonic moments, drawing on my first-hand experiences of those moments and contexts. And then together, we came back together and we refined both Malcolm's gesture language into um, a key of sorts for Zach Kelly and mine's um, composition as a map of sorts um, in order to produce the sketch that you saw. Um, and so, Annie is going to help all of us perform some of the key, and we'll play some of the individual clips drawn out of the um, textured composition. Um, and she'll explain more about that process. So I'm not an archaeologist, and um, I'm a sociocultural anthropologist and also a dancer, and so for me this form is more readable than form that you all sometimes present in, just to clear that accessibility question. So anyone who wants to join me, I encourage you to stand up. Most of the moves are standing. And what we'll do is we'll listen to the sounds on their own, abstracted, and then I can explain what I heard when I first heard it, and then what I thought they might be, or what they were to me in my own experience of interpretation. And this is the, this is the key. It's like, here are the sounds and then here are the movements. And there was some text in between that I wrote, um, <clears throat> just on my computer, like, which I'll sort of explain. Yeah. Let's do, let's start with, let's start with, Something not too crazy. Let's start with mixed blessing. Okay. So when I heard when I heard this this person narrating this <coughs> landscape or this like sort of disaster, and then he talked about the mixed blessing, I thought, well, what is a mixed blessing? It's uh, it's a woman. It's like something. It's okay. It's good. It's bad. So I so, I, so the move for that is this, and anyone can try it, and we'll and we'll listen to it again. It's like your hands are like this, and you're like, it's like a mixed blessing, and your face is just complete joy, but you're like ripping through your It was all dry here. And then switch the water valve off. So you cut off your hip so that your left leg bends. Yeah, exactly. So you're like this. But your left hand is still on your shoulder. And then your hands go to the back of your leg. And then when he says the water went back down, you drag your fingers along the back of your leg. Should we listen to it again? Mm -hmm. Uncle, we shut the water down. We shut the valve. And this would fill up. And in the day, when you can get out there and irrigate, it sends the, the, the water back down. 
and you had a nice big full pitcher of water and plenty of air to be working. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all. Cool. Okay, so um, okay, so for the bells, um, I knew from some of Annie's work that that the bells were about control and domination, and I knew a little bit about that history. But when I heard the bells, I just thought classic, precise, iconic. What is classic and precise and iconic? It's slowly moving your body into like the most like draggy like 50s <laughs> most, like that <laughs> so can we hear bells and everybody just like close your eyes if you don't want to feel like you're being left out <laughs> and then just like once you're in it like get more in it <laughs> next one <laughs> something sort of like centered and um, back even and balanced and so it's like you slowly move your legs your weight from one foot to another and as you do that you take little steps out and out and out
So thanks, Annie, Eddie, and Zach. Uh, so next up we have uh, Ruth Tringa, uh, who's professor of the grad school in anthropology at UC Berkeley. Uh, she's uh, the president and creative director at the Center for Digital, Digital Archaeology interested in creating database narratives and recombinant histories, uh, and her focus has been throughout her career on early agricultural societies in southeastern Europe and Turkey. So we're going to move the We need to all come towards, for us, for this one, we want to fill this space. Come closer. The action is going to be all here in front of the screen. Thank you. 